what you're seeing here on screen is the trophozoit of Balantidium coloid. Remember, this is the only pathogenic ciliophora organisms that we have to learn. Not much of details to be known about it, but look at the fact here. This organism on proper visualization will exhibit a very thin layer of the cilia. The cilia stops here. So generally, cilia is very short compared to that of a flagella and it will have a very huge nucleus. That is what you are seeing here. And that nucleus can actually remain the same size even if the trophozoite gets converted into a cyst. Look at this here. The nucleus is big here. The difference is here. You do not have any kind of cilia. No cilia while it becomes a cyst and there is a proper cilia when it becomes a trophozoite. What are the common factors that you have to know? Balantidium's clinical course runs parallel to that of amoebiasis. The balantidiasis is just like that of amoebiasis. What do I mean by that? Balantidium can actually cause intestinal balantidiasis just like that of intestinal amoebiasis. It is capable of causing dysentery and diarrhea though the intensity of dysentery is not very massive and it is not very high as in case of amoebiasis still it is capable of causing dysentery by causing minimal amount of inflammation in the local area. At the same time the organism's movement is actually because of cilia while entamoeba is moving because of its pseudopodia. So this has a bigger advantage than that of amoeba in moving forward and this organism can beat its cilia completely inside the GI mucosa. If it is capable of entering into the circulation it is capable of causing extra intestinal balanteriasis also just like entamoeba histolytica. The problem is that much of abscess formation is a property of entamoeba histolytica, less of abscesses are formed by palantidium. Also, this is capable of causing high-grade fever and chills along with the rhesuses.